Look, I'll try and whiz through this. I've got a lot of slides, OK? I apologise. So some of them will go through quickly. Uh, that's just because if we had more time, some of these topics would be a talk all by themselves. And in fact, they are. They're transplanted. For those of you who individually want more information, contact me anytime. We can go through all this. So there are a few bits and pieces we're going to talk about. I'm not going to get to pulpy kidney. Um, though, talking about the sorghum and the prussic acid risk, the, um, I mean, the DPI, there are a lot of samples of sorghum tested this year, and the DPI put an official warning out because so many of them were coming back with worrying levels of prussic acid, which is cyanide. Uh, however, um, my equivalents around the state do a lot of uh, talking amongst themselves. There are, so there are a lot of stunted crops further west, and people had no choice but to let cattle in on them. They weren't going to waste the feed and surprisingly few dramas, even though really they should have been considered high risk with respect to cyanide. We've had you know, so, quite some deaths on sorghum hay in particular here, but in every case that I can think of, I think it was the nitrate level in there that killed them. Uh, there might have been a risky level of cyanide in there, but all of them had a, had a nasty level of, of nitrate. Nitrates is in this talk because that's killed more cattle in this region than anything else in the last few years. Right, off we go. They're the, th the things I was going to harp on about. Kaikuyu poisoning is a bit of an update. Some of you will have heard most of this before. Nitrate poisoning because it is topical. The sale yard issues, if we don't get to it, it's just to remind you that fit the load guidelines. Don't put the stock carriers in a bad situation by trying to get them to put uh, you know, terribly poor animals onto their truck or animals that clearly are not walking on all four legs. Uh, because of the situation, um, with respect to people having to get rid of cattle, they're running out of water, animals that really shouldn't be coming into the sale yard, as long as they're strong enough to get in there and stay upright, we've sort of been turning a bit of a blind eye to it because the waits for the, for the meatworks are so long that uh, we don't want them perishing on people's properties. So if they're strong enough and they've been coming into the sale yard, we've been cutting people some slack. But don't push it too far, please. Uh, you, you're creating an offence for the, for the transporter as well as yourself and your stock agent if animals that are not fit to, to load are ending up in sale yards. It's supported now across Australia by legislation. I'm bound to point that out. Pink eye we'll get to. Blue-green algae is quite topical. That'll be the last one. OK, um, that's from last year. You know, we, we had another outbreak. We could expect it. Uh, these are the risk factors that we see. Now, we have had the right conditions for Kaikuyu poisoning again. It only seems to happen when we've had a drought and then we get drought-breaking rain in late summer or autumn. Now, we've had that but I don't think many of you have had enough rain that we've got the conditions that might suit Kaikuyu poisoning. We haven't got that leaping out of the ground, all's well, you know, we've got an enormous crop of Kaikuyu coming through. However, some of the people around Gloucester, where we do periodically see it, probably have had enough rain for it. And if that's the case, in the next week or so, we'll probably see some cases. So it needs to have been um, significantly uh, stressed. We don't see it on irrigated pasture. Um, so, because it, 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 it hasn't been badly stressed enough. And this is important. It occurs when there's no alternative feed. So either it's fence line to fence line Kaikuyu, or if there's a bit of other feed in there, they're finished with that and they're forced to eat the Kaikuyu. And that's when we see problems. Uh, it, it appears to have a bad taste associated with it. So if you give them something else to eat, they'll go after it and you'll be saved. Um, that's a typical paddock where Kaikuyu poisoning has occurred and that's the solution, that's the best. Where there is nothing else in that paddock apart from Kaikuyu, you have to provide them with something else. Um, that's, we, we did a survey and we were very limited. There were more people affected than nine herds, but we wanted to be absolutely sure it was Kaikuyu poisoning. And people have a habit, they'll hear there's a Kaikuyu poisoning outbreak, so if they have some animals drop dead, I'm suffering from it too. Uh, we were very strict with the case definitions here. It had to be where there was nothing but Kaikuyu to eat. So people, cattle on mixed pasture, I doubt very much you're gonna lose uh, cattle to Kaikuyu poisoning. Um, one to three days of access, where are we? 
one to two weeks after drought breaking rain. So we might not be there yet, but watch out for it. Uh, those that are affected, most of them die. If they recover though, they tend to recover completely. So if you get affected in the end and you do lose some animals and you're satisfied you know what it is, get in touch with us because we're interested in knowing whether there's any prolonged effect in these animals. It gets a bit complicated to explain, but it's to do with, with the damage in the gut. It's exactly the same under a microscope as if they had grain poisoning. Now, if you have animals that survive grain poisoning, a lot of those will have secondary problems later on, and I can't understand why we don't see secondary problems in the cows that survive kaikuyu poisoning. It doesn't make good sense. So there's quite a lot about kaikuyu poisoning we don't yet know. That's what it does. But it, it's fluid dynamics. It destroys them. So the poor cows will be well hydrated, and they're eating very watery, lush kaikuyu. There's plenty of fluid going into them, and yet they'll become extraordinarily dehydrated. So then you pinch their skin up, it stays up, sunken eyes. A lot of the fluid from their bloodstream ends up rushing into their rumen. And you can hear some of them slosh as they walk. Now, because they're terribly dehydrated, they know they want a drink to reverse that and they'll stand at a trough or in a dam and attempt to drink, but their gut is completely full. So it must, it's a bit of a cruel death. It must be terribly uncomfortable. They can't fit any more fluid in. So drooling, sham drinking, that sort of thing, staggering, down they go, and uh, the majority of them die. There, there you go. So that's, that's the clinical signs. Uh, Carol mentioned the potassium levels. We'll come to that in a moment. So that's a typical animal, and you can see there's nothing else in there for that girl to get to. Um, obviously, the room is pretty full, and you get a great flood of fluid and, um, and plant material when you open them up. That's typical of kaikuyu poisoning. What you can't see is that there is genuine damage to the lining of all of the stomachs, and we're, st we're still trying to understand that. It's like an acidosis damage. Now, you can't read that. <laughs> I, I'm aware of that. What it, what it was meant to show you with a typical uh, case, the damage that's recorded here in the stomachs. Uh, here's another one. It's exactly the same. Ruminitis, necrosuppurative, acute multifocal with intracorneal pustules. I know that doesn't mean much to you. There's another one. Take my word for it. It says exactly the same thing. Uh, and again, um, and they're significant. We'll come to the next couple of slides. These are the theories about what's causing it. There's still a strong um, a bit of support for the idea it's a fungus that grows on the kai kaikuyu uh, during that rapidly growing phase. Uh, whether or not that's true, there are other people who, who now suggest it's to do with the fact that the young plant is terribly high in potassium and there is certainly a, uh, an imbalance, an electrolyte imbalance associated with all this fluid rushing in back into the rumen. The trouble with it is, if you do a literature search worldwide, we can't find any evidence that high potassium by itself causes physical damage to the lining of the stomach. So, I don't know. So, there are theories. Um, uh, that's some of them there. We don't know. Um, Boral, this was just to show you that we have high potassium. That's the high K that Carol was talking about. That's in eyeball fluid out of a dead animal. Um, now, this is the, the, the cat amongst the pigeons, though. This was an animal I got excited about last year or the year before because it had all, it was a, it was a classic case of kaikuyu poisoning, sham drinking, sloshing when she walked, all that sort of stuff, all the post-mortem changes, but she was on hay. It was meant to be kaikuyu hay. That would be the first time we'd had a death on hay. It has to be on fresh pasture. However, when I got the sample of the hay, it was mixed hay. So there's a problem. So you can get similar damage and similar signs and it's, it's not even attributable necessarily to Kaikuyu. And this is one of Digby's. It happened uh, last year during the, the outbreak last year, which is more limited. Exactly the same signs in the stomach and it's on sorghum. So there's more work that needs to be done on this and you'd say someone should do a PhD on it, but because we, we typically only get outbreaks every 10 years, it might take you a while to complete your PhD. Um, and that was just to show you just how high the potassium levels in the plants are. I know you can't read that either. Reducing the risk. Well, the main thing is be aware that kaikuyu is a fantastic uh, pasture species 
Uh, it, and in, it, this is rare. This doesn't happen often. You have to have these conditions and we don't understand what sets it off. Uh, just be aware that possibly in this kind of environment, if you've got a lot of rain now and you've got a lot of Kaikuyu, there could be a risk. Now, the reason we mention it here is because I'd say to you normally, you need to get yourself a few good round bales that are of safe hay and have them in the shed just in case you get this sort of situation. You might struggle at the moment to get yourself some good round bales to put out when you need them in a hurry if you suddenly have uh, a foot of kaikuyu coming up out of the ground. So just, just be aware if you've got those sort of paddocks, alternative feed is the secret. I worry about this salt uh, thing that we created an urban myth. Um, people now are telling you that salt will be protective. Put out some sodium chloride blocks. We were just curious. We asked people to put salt blocks out because there is an imbalance between potassium and sodium. Sodium is that Na there. And so if you put, we were interested in seeing whether the cattle that don't normally crave salt, sodium chloride, would go for it if you put the lick blocks out. Now that unfortunately has been misunderstood and I hear coming back to me, you only need to put a couple of salt blocks out and that'll protect them. I doubt that very much. Uh, but giving them access to alternative feed is, will reliably save them. So that's the advice. This one is from an agronomist, Jock, uh, Josh Hack, and it, it, uh, what Carol was talking about, it's bad policy anyway to flog your kaikuyu at that very young stage of growth. So pasture management should dictate that you let it get to the four or five leaf stage, which I'm reliably told is when it's you know, a foot and a half high or whatever, or at least a foot high. And it, see, that period of risk with the young growing plant, it only lasts three or four weeks, and then you're right. I've seen people slash this stuff and, oh, well, we're not going to use it. The risk seems to pass. So I'd be a little bit wary. If we're not going to get a lot more regrowth uh, before winter, I just don't know if I'd waste it. Uh, I think you need to be careful with it and you watch the cattle you put back in, but I don't think I'd waste it. If it were mine, I'd leave it there. Um, there you go, that's a solution. Now, nitrate poisoning. This has killed a lot of cattle. Uh, and it, what's diabolical is it's, it's usually very good hay that'll do it. Um, so this is what happens in a ruminant. Let's forget about the non-ruminants. Uh, nitrate in the feed is converted to nitrite in the rumen and then converted further into ammonia in the rumen and then everything's sweet. Uh, the next slide, I think, demonstrates the problem. Oh, well, perhaps you can't see that, but if you get stuck in this middle stage here, if your rumen is not adapted to turning nitrate quickly into nitrite and even more quickly into ammonia, the nitrite is absorbed into the bloodstream where it prevents the blood from carrying oxygen. And so these animals will be breathing, affected animals will turn brown in their gums, their vagina, anywhere they've got a mucous membrane because the, the, the blood circulating through there is no longer carrying oxygen. That's what kills them. And it kills them quickly. So the textbooks will say, well, that's just, you can see them dotted around there. They were, there were other animals a heap on that little feedlot there. This was just everything that died, of course, were the animals he brought in the afternoon before that were not adapted to the feed. And that's the critical thing. We test a lot of hay for nitrate levels and silage and pasture, and um, we've had some doozy results. But even those very high results that shouldn't be safe to feed to anything, the, the fellow who made the hay will say, well, I'm feeding it to my own cows and there's no problem. Adaptation with a ruminant is a fantastic thing. So that's what you see. Rapid, noisy breathing, what they call chocolate blood, chocolate-coloured mucous membranes. They look more purple, a lot of the case. If, so if you've got one dead, they do blow up uh, terminally. They go off pretty quickly. You'll see them dotted around with a leg in the air. It looks a lot like a black leg carcass. Uh, fortunately for us, there's a, there's a pretty simple test. There should not be any nitrite or nitrate in an animal's eyeball. So we carry dipsticks with us and we put a few uh, drops of uh, aqueous humour on there and there's your diagnosis and then we send a sample of the feed away. Otherwise, there's not a lot to go by. Um, the abortions, yeah. Animals that survive it, in my experience, survive it completely except for that. Uh, because the, once you deprive the fetus of, of oxygenated blood, well, it's not going to survive that even if the cow survives. There is a, um, an antidote, but it's illegal to use it in food producing animals now. 
But if you have valuable animals and you know a vet that's got bottles of methylene blue sitting on his shelf still, you'll save them if you're quick enough. But geez, you've got to be quick. Uh, that was an easy diagnosis because there's nothing else in that yard to feed them. But it even shows you that even, you know, what you wouldn't think of as high risk nitrate hay is like, that was Rhodes grass hay. But if they're unadapted cattle and their, their rumen really can't tolerate that level of nitrate in the feed. So, what do we got? Risk factors, yeah, purchased hay and, feed, uh, hay and silage fed to unadapted cattle. I'd point out though, silage is a much lower risk if it's been allowed to sit. The trouble during this drought is, the silage that some people are getting, it's barely been wrapped and they're feeding it out. It's not silage at all, it hasn't undergone fermentation and so there hasn't been the opportunity for the nitrate levels to come down and they come down significantly. The DPI prime fact will tell you, I think it says 40 to 60 per cent uh, you know, with decent fermentation. We followed some kaikuyu that was cut and made into silage up at Stroud last year and it was at about 23,000 parts per million when it was wrapped and it was down to next to nothing uh, after three months. So I think that, you know, what do you do with these high risk pastures? And I've sampled them and followed them through up at Scone and they just got worse until I couldn't afford to test them anymore. Uh, so I'd make them into silage, I think is the best solution and then test them before you feed them out, but leave them wrapped for a while. Yeah, lack of adaptation, hungry cattle, that, that's the classic one, you know, first access, it looks, it'll be the best hay in, on the planet and it's such a disappointing thing for people to spend a lot of money on hay and drag animals through drought and then, put, and then they come out the next day and that's what's killed their animals is the good feed. So just be wary of it. A, a sudden change of diet is never a good idea for a ruminant. You know, there are, there are a number of things that can go wrong and this is the most common lately. So, um, now diet is important though. If you've got your animals on a, a, some pellets in their diets, a, a carbohydrate level, that helps. It helps to reduce the risk. If you've got a healthy room and flora, all the bugs in there, uh, and, and carbohydrates um, contribute to that obviously, as does sulphur. Not, don't go berserk, but that seems to help reduce the risk. Plant factors, oats and rye, as part, they're famous for it. Heap of it in sorghum though, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, but look, millet hay, you, you name it. There's nitrate levels, it depends on the fertiliser history of the pasture. It also depends on, and we'll get to it I think in the, in the next um, slide, but some of these factors, have, have the plants been stressed? So if, there, if it's a failed crop that's been made into hay in particular, uh, it's a drama. Um, stage of maturity, so younger plants are meant to be higher in nitrates, uh, part of the plant. The, the nitrate levels typically are higher in the stalks of the plant and now when an animal grazes pasture it's eating the leaves off normally so you make it into hay they tend to eat more stalk than they normally would so hay has that risk as well. Um, obviously use of nitrogenous fertilisers is, is going to increase the uptake into the plant, low soil sulphur and molybdenum, you know areas where there, it, it's really where cattle have defecated and urinated a lot, they're going to have high nitrogen levels. Shady areas, I mean, I wonder about that. Um, the reason the shady areas of the paddock have been nominated is because we're seeing some alarming variation in uh, the nitrate levels in bales from the same paddock. And that makes it very difficult for people, what do I do with the rest of the shed full? Which ones are the dangerous ones? Which ones are okay? Whether it's, a, and I've spoken to various agronomists about it, I'm told that, well, it's probably the stuff that's made around the headlands where the, the irrigator isn't reaching properly and they've been more stressed, maybe it's that. Uh, what is known is that nitrate levels go up uh, in cloudy weather, that sort of thing. So if there's a shady area uh, and where cattle have congregated under trees, maybe. Uh, maybe there, it's going to be higher there. So this is trying to understand why we're getting variation within a batch because that's a bit heartbreaking. Um, there you go, the cloudy weather, drought, wilting. Um, bear in mind though, you make it into hay, the levels stay there for a long time. They don't change. The only thing that'll change is if they get a bit wet, then it can turn into nitrate before they, they even eat it, so it might be even riskier. Uh, but essentially, you make it into hay, that's it forever. The, the, the nitrate levels are fixed. You make it into silage and they will decrease. <laughs> So what do you do with it? We've been through this. Uh, if you've got high risk, I'd, I'd sample it as pasture, test it. 
And I'm probably bound to point out the DPI has given us some money and we'll, we'll, at the moment we've been got word we'll get more money. We're doing a lot of feed testing for free. So if you're in that situation where you're wondering, is this a terribly risky crop? Bring a sample into us and we'll send it away and see just how risky it is. If it is a high risk crop, what do you do? Well, you can monitor it. I wouldn't put, obviously, unadapted cattle in on it. That, that, that would be diabolical. Uh, making it into hay won't solve anything. That just becomes a risk for you or whoever you sell it to. But making it into silage, I think, is the safest option where you don't want to waste it. Um, this here is an issue to us. And I think, yeah, I've, we mentioned that. I'd be worried about the nitrate levels in the sorghum hay more than the prussic acid content. Can anyone read this? Well, I'll read it for you. <laughs> These are two different samples of sorghum hay. This one killed a dozen heifers overnight last week. This one is one of the bales that was left in the shed from exactly the same batch. Right, so that's the variability within a batch. And, the, and those animals have been on that same hay for weeks. And so I'm guessing they'd been on it at that level. And then you have the odd bale like that, and we've had them up to 56,000 parts per million. So it, it's just one of those things, you, you, and that's, that's very frustrating because we can't afford to test every bale for you. And some people that have these deaths then are looking in their shed going, well, what do I do with the rest of that? Which are the dangerous bales and which aren't? So what would be a fantastic thing if the government has the money for some research would be to be able to create some sort of test strip for farmers that's cheap, and easy enough to use, and with hay that's difficult because it's a, you, know, you need a liquid component to put dipsticks into. Um, I just cut them up and add a bit of water and make a soup and put my dipstick in to give me some indication of just how high the levels are. If it jumps straight to purple, I think, well, we better send that away for a test. But if we could come up with some sort of dipstick that would allow you cheaply to test every bale, then that variability that we're getting across these batches would be solved. Um, we've discussed this. Please don't put pressure on, on your carrier. If he says that that girl really shouldn't be going to the sale yards, don't twist his arm. Uh, NVDs too. I get this is from Stephen Moy and others. Anyone here who hasn't filled their NVD properly uh, and they're sent consigned stuff to Wingham Meatworks will know all about this. They won't. You'll just say, oh, well, tick that for me over the phone. No, you'll be in the car and you'll be going up there to tick it yourself. Uh, they won't do that sort of thing for you. And they've asked me to remind you, just complete the things properly. Th that's a stat deck, your national vendor declaration. So please, make the effort. There, that's the advertisement I said I'd put in for the stock agents. Pink eye, now the, the reason I've got that in there, I'm a bit different to, to old man Todd here who still injects antibiotics into the um, eyelids because you need good restraint for that. Uh, the, the ointments, there are two different brands. There's the old Auburn and I ointment uh, and there's now the OptiClox. I use the OptiClox because it's actually uh, got more of the, the antibiotic in it um, per squeeze. Fantastic stuff, fantastic. Uh, eyes that really you wouldn't believe that they're going to come back. They're pointed and look like they're going to rupture. Fantastic gear. Uh, fly control is extremely important, indulge in that as well. Uh, I, I love that purple spray I used to put on horse wounds and things like that. And I particularly like the aerosol version because it sticks better. If you go to the vet now, you'll get the pump pack because you know, it doesn't have the hissing sound, it doesn't bother them, but most will run off the face. It's not designed to go into the eye, but fly control is important. Insecticidal ear tags, a pour on with easy dose, or Cydectin actually has pretty good uh, repellent the, the fly control is, is important, and one of the reasons it's important is this. Uh, Myroxella bovis is what's in the vaccine. The vaccine is good, but the vaccine only lasts for five to six months, and it only protects against Myroxella bovis. And there were enough vaccine failures in the last year or two for Coopers, who make Piligard, the vaccine, to look into it. If you, look at, if you Google it, you'll find that there's another bacteria called Myroxella bivoculi. And uh, the older pieces of work would say, it's actually not important in creating um, pink eye, you need Myroxella bovis. Turns out that might not be right. And so you'll see stuff under the heading of winter pink eye. If you have a vaccine failure, Coopers has encouraged me then to swab those eyes. Let's see if it isn't Myroxella bivoculi. 
and I've only done one. It was at Tokal's own dairy. They were, and sure enough, it was uh, Moraxella bivoculi. Different strain, and the vaccine does not work against it. So if you can't rely entirely on the vaccine, because there are different strains getting around, then fly control becomes very important indeed. The antibiotic ointments are fantastic. The patches also are good, mainly because they stop you worrying about the eye, I think. Um, but, you know, <laughs> it stops the, the flies getting on there. The other thing with pink eye treatment, and I see people do this because the, the tube will say, the instructions will say, treat both eyes, the good eye and the bad eye, if you've got an unaffected eye. And then they'll run cattle up the race and they go from that animal's good eye, then they treat that bad eye, then they go to the next animal's good eye, they've become the fly. You know, you've got to be more careful than that with your biosecurity. You go from an, in, an animal where contact with an infected eye is what's going to spread it, and they haven't washed their hands in between. Also, even though the antibiotics should cure it, I would never use, because the tube will say use a quarter or a third of a tube in, in, in an affected eye, but treat the good eye as well. I would never go from an, an animal's infected eye to some other animal's good eye. I, on my, I, you know, in the yards, no, they're for infected eyes. Yeah, the new tubes are the ones you use on the good eyes and, and wash your hands in between. Sorry for that lecture, but um, that's how it spreads. Blue-green algae, last thing. Look, there's a lot of it. There's a lot of it around. Uh, be aware of it. And the most common one that we see, and that's another service we're offering for free at the moment, and that is, we'll, we'll tell you, um, we'll send the water away and, and have it identified and see whether it's a, a poisonous species or not, because not all of them are. And I'd have to probably say, and don't, don't quote me on this, I think the risk associated with blue-green algae is probably overstated. When you have a bad bloom and a lot of toxin in the water, it can be diabolical. It can kill large numbers of animals where that's the only source of water. And those things have happened. I rarely see it. Uh, and we do see quite a lot of, you know, the samples go away. Most of them are microcystis species. I had one last week that was anabina, about one in ten is anabina. It was a fluoro green, it was uh, impressive. Uh, but they're not all um, creating toxin all the time. Uh, and so you'll have an algal bloom and you'll be tempted to treat it. If you use the, the um, products on the market like Coptrol or copper sulphate, and it is a toxic species that may not have had been producing any toxin, when you kill it, you will create toxin. And so just, just be a little bit careful about that. What we're looking for at the moment is we're trying to find uh, test strips that you could use that we could hand out to you that will allow you to test and see whether there is actually toxin in the water column. Most of these uh, blue-green algae live on the surface or you know, at the top of the water column. But not all, that's the trouble. But the vast majority do. So you'll see the wind blow them to one side and the suggestion will be that they've got a smell and the cattle will go to the other side of the dam to drink. Will they? They're my own steers. Now, you know, they might be retarded, but they, <laughs> they seem to seek it out. They've got a river they could stand in that's flowing. And, you know, and that's why I think it's a bit overstated. I have that every year in that lagoon there like that. Uh, they're, they're green from the chest down most years during summer. So they're not always in bloom and they're not always toxic, but that's not ideal. But uh, my neighbour who draws water out of that hasn't killed any dairy cows with it. Have, you know, because a lot of them are on the surface, have your foot valve obviously below the surface, you know, drop it away. There are designs for things, little paddle boats that will aerate the water and, and, and try and deal with that. Um, you know, that once, once you get into a trough or a tank, you can treat it more easily. You can, then you can deal with it um, more effectively. And the aeration process of pumping out of a, a, a lagoon like that will help. Uh, but what would be nice would be some sort of dipstick, and they do exist in America at least, and some of the human water places or the labs will, will have them, but they're not cheap. Uh, and of course, the human guys have to be, for human drinking supply, have to be careful. Uh, I've got a couple of different sources. If you go to the, the prime fact, it'll tell you that the, the toxins, if you treat them, you need to leave that alone for three or four weeks before you could use it for stock. 
I've got a toxicology book that says five days would be enough. And then I spoke to a human lab bloke and he said, oh, they can last for six months and they can be as far down as 18 metres in the water column. So it becomes difficult, uh, but honestly, we don't see many deaths associated with it. I, so I wouldn't go mad, but I'd also be reluctant to treat that because if there isn't a problem yet, you might create one. There are some alternatives though. I mean, look, everyone knows how you get them in this sort of weather, warm, warm water in the middle of summer, shrinking away. And then if you do get a bit of rain, or even if you haven't, if the cattle like to stand and shit in the lagoon or whatever, the nutrient load in there is obviously um, gonna suit algal blooms. And these sudden deaths, you know, and liver damage is the most common one, although there is a neurotoxin. Um, what I wanted to mention, because I'm interested in trialling this, there are various um, things that you can, can do that won't elaborate toxin, but will make it unsuitable for the algae to, to, um, to grow. Now, this is from, I think, from uh, Mackenzie's book, but the ag, if you Google ag, I think we've got them out there, haven't we, Cole? There's an ag fact from Western Australia that talks about barley straw there, and they'll actually give you a recipe for how much of it you, had to, you have to add to a body of water in terms of surface area, which is a lot easier to calculate than the volume of a dam, surface area, uh, and how to go about it. Use of barley straw apparently is pretty effective in stopping algae from growing and it'll settle out and you don't create any toxin. And there are talks for even creating like you know, vegetation around the edge so that your inflow to your dams is filters the manure and stops all that sort of stuff. There's a lot of information about this, so by all means go mad. But if you're, the trouble is I can't access barley straw at the moment because I actually wanted to try and see how well that works and how quickly the bloom disappears. But uh, we're interested in that. If someone has a, thinks they can get hold of some barley straw and knows where to get it, we'll probably pay for it if you're prepared to have a crack at it to see if it works. And there's other bits and pieces there, gypsum, but I mean, look, all this information, the New South Wales DPI prime fact uh, and, and various others. That's just, the, there you go. That's what the prime fact looks like. There's another prime fact. There's stacks of them. I think I'm finished. <laughs>